Well, I'm here with my pals, some <laughs> ModPo team pals who came all the way from Philadelphia and New York and North Carolina. And we're here in Edinburgh at Fruit Market. Ian Morrison, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, apologies to those who are encountering this, encountering this conversation without the context of some others that we've made here today. Um, because there people, we, don't, we don't generally want to laugh at the introduction of someone so kind and nice and generous, but they're laughing because I've been introducing him before, just to let the record show. Um, thank you, Ian. Uh, Anthony, thank you for joining us for this. Leanne, thank you. Lainey, thank you. And Irene, thank you for doing this in advance. We have Peter Manson's poem, Between Cup and Lip, which is a um, compositionally... Uh, it's a translation uh, mix of, um, of a poem by Mallarmé that's in English called Salutation um, and Peter's own words, we think. So what's going to happen here is that uh, Ian and Anthony are going to read it. We're improvising a performance that will separate the all caps which are or aren't meant to be spoken more loudly, but in this case will be at least spoken by the voice of Anthony, I believe. And then Ian's going to read the lower case, which would presumably be Peter's words. And then Leanne Brown is going to read the Mallarmé in a translation. I'm sorry I didn't identify it, just something I found on the web that will probably be unsatisfactory, but it'll put, put into the record the basic sense in English of what the Mallarmé poem does. And of course, Peter already used a translation, and I'm not sure they're the same. But no, so I mean, it's, his, a own, lot of it's his own translation. It's his own translation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, thanks to the both of you. Between cup and lip. Nothing, meniscus, virgin. Itty grown back into tra. Verse. What hope? Refers to nothing but the cup. Pidity. So slowly. Knocked with the candle. Upside down. This one? A troop of sirens on the ceiling. Could not awaken. Drowns. In blood liquor. My divers. Means of alienating. Friends. Suppose. We navigate. To the root. With me. Slash my blood. Already on the poop. Sample at 34. I. Deck you. With surplus fat. To constitute the proud. Yes, I don't confess. That cuts the crap to fit its cloth. Wave crested. Lightning lit. Earl. I'm buttonholed by strategic drunkenness. That doesn't even hurt. Fear only the swell in breasts I bring to bear upon art. Should rightly acclaim this benison. Solitude kills real people. A reef er, is just for now. A star turns on to any trick that validates self. My image cast down on your our canvas. My motive seamlessly opaque. That was extraordinary. <laughs> I was good, <laughs> they, We just worked this out. That they would do it, and then they did it like they'd been doing it for years together. It's amazing. Um, so now we're putting into the record the English of the Mallarmé. Salutation. Nothing, this foam and virgin verse to designate naught but the cup. Such far off there plunges a troop of many sirens upside down. We are navigating, my diverse friends. I already on the poop. You, the splendid prow which cuts the mane of thunders and of winters, a fine ebriety calls me without fear of its rolling to carry upright this toast, solitude, reef, star, to whatever it was that was worth our sail's white solicitude. Thank you, Leanne. Lainey, do you want to start and tell us a little bit about what you think is going on here? Well, hearing the reading that you both did, I was just in this 
rich landscape of the language first and foremost, you know, before thinking about even what's happening here, just this piece in itself, the, the sound of every word is just, it's just amazing. Um, well, so we have a translation of a translation. We have... What does a, a translation squared typically mean for you? Distance from the original? Not necessarily. More like rogue translation or... So as a serious translator of Mallarmé and then Peter Manson again translates the translation into something that is more slant um, now, but there's still a sensibility that's the same. So I'll just say, to be brief, this idea of a, of a life as a poet, as a, as a perilous journey, as a, as a dangerous drunken journey in, in both versions of that we just heard. Wonderful, thank you. Leanne, do you want to take it from there? Oh, I just, um, I just love the title between cup and lip and, how, you know, many a slip between the cup and the lip and it's supposed to be, you know, th things that won't always turn out like you planned, but I always think of it as like a, um, I, I, I feel like there's a tongue there. I feel like there's a slipping of the tongue into, you know, mishearings, but also um, like, you know, French kissing. There's all kinds of great things happening there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I, am I wrong that I think Peter's, one of Peter's books is titled Between Cup and Lip? I think that's the case. And I think it might even be available through an American press like Miami mm -hmm. University, yeah. press of Miami Keith of Tuma's Ohio. Keith Tuma's press, yeah. Keith Tuma's press, yes, the great Keith Tuma. Um, Anthony, further thoughts on this, please? That this feels like being on board the, a much less polite boat uh, than in the Malarmé. Because I'm looking at, I'm, I'm thinking, I woke up this morning and chose violence, so I'm looking <laughs> at uh, a deck you with surplus flat and thinking of sailors fighting on the deck of a ship uh, and all the things that one would do when uh, confined in a voyage. And so even though the poem isn't incredibly long, uh, it uh, seems to take us very much uh, on a violent journey. You know, something almost too much happens. Uh, in every line. I'm also fascinated by the word meniscus, uh, just because it's such an oddly scientific word. Uh, in, uh, as everybody will know, meniscus, when you hold, there isn't really enough here, and you look at some liquid in a glass, uh, and uh, there's the sort of curving line you can see. And uh, you can imagine doing the flat line underneath that horizontal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a very weird sort of thing, and then it, that, that scientific line makes me, that scientific diction makes me start reading the whole thing uh, as a, a kind of diagnostic poem as well yeah. of the poetic condition, the poetic solitude. Ian, you can say whatever you want, but I'm just going to throw in something you might want to respond to. It seems to be a sonnet. It's not a traditional sonnet. It ends with two triads, but is there any sonnetness about it? Or ignore that and say whatever you want. Yeah, I'm not sure I've got anything on sonnet other than to sort of note the kind of, the, the, the knowingness about its verse that, that, that Peter brings out. I have, I have seen a version of this published by Peter that doesn't have the interjections, but retains the space. So there, there's another published version um, really? you can find online that just has the Mallarmé Without with the, spaces that implied yeah. that he knew what the words were, lowercase, yeah. but eliminated. But which, and I don't know, I mean, I only found that last night, so I don't know the order of publication, whether that was something that he withheld for a while before publishing this, that he had this kind of ghost version in there. But I mean, I, I think Anthony's right to say diagnostic, because for me, there is something uh, medicalized about the, the, you know, the condition of the poet. I mean, like, the, um, Lainey, you talked earlier about the drunken journey of poetics, and I think embracing the kind of like the ecstaticness, which isn't literal drunkenness. But I think this poem, I mean, it, the, the, the one big change from the Mallarmé is the title, because the title is Salut in, in French, like gre greeting or, or hello, hello or so. Yeah, yeah um, whereas between cup and lip, like that's drinking. Well, you isn't know, that something yeah. you might say when lifting a yeah. cup? 
yes, you might see the yes, that's good. Pure health, yeah, slant like day, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for me, there's like there, there's something in the verse of the poem that's addressing abjection and you know being on the poop sample at 34. That's someone with with not a healthy bowel <laughs> going on. Um, so poop is a pun. Yeah, poop is and like, being on the poop. So is dick. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I feel like there's a kind of candor in the voice of this poem that I feel tremendous compassion for. Yeah. Irene, what are your thoughts? I, I didn't ask you this before, so if it's not the case, just go past it. But your French is, is, is very good. Did you happen to find the Malinay in French? Yes, and um, I find it super interesting because it's like a, a poem in a poem, or even. <laughs> My watch was reminding me that this is, we should be talking about French. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a poem inside a poem inside a poem, and like even the French uh, Malarmé original has uh, words that when when Peter Manson takes them actually change the meaning when when he's uh, using them in English. But you could have like the Malarmé version and this poem, and then I feel like the capitalized words are like another poem by themselves. So I really like this idea of simultaneous perspective that are happening all the time that kind of brought me also a bit to drunkness and you know when just double seeing things it's like here we are really having all these simultaneous poems that are happening at the same time wonderful Lainey why would a poet a contemporary poet an experimental poet an avant-garde poet whatever um, why would why do this? What, what, what is the purpose of doing it? What is achieved? What is it, why is it a good well, idea? First, why is it interesting? Well, my first response is why not? But, <laughs> but then Too beyond sorry. that, I would say because translation is never a copy. Translation is an art. And so the more translations, the better creating a field of translations that are in conversation with the work across time. Um, and to make it now, like how do we, how did Peter Manson read Mallarmé in the time that this was composed and then how do we read it? And one thing that's jumping out at me that's the very now is thinking about the way certain words are broken to multiply the meanings like traverse and cup, cupidity and um, there's more. Reef and reefer. Reef and reefer, right? So that, in a way, it, it situates the poem in the moment, in a way, newly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Leanne, your thoughts? Well, I just want to go back to the sonnetish idea, because to me, sonnet is a little sound, sonetta, and this is very sound. It's a, it's a song. It's singing the language. It's like that it, hyper um, musicality. That's what I see with the sonnet here. And also, drunken boat. It's, it reminds me of... Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. The Rambo, yeah. Yeah, we should explain. Can you spell out oh. the reference to Drunken Boat? Oh, just the great poem by R Arthur Rambo. And what is it right after this, I guess? Or of, um, you know, synth synth uh, synesthesia and wild um, mixing of senses. And, right. But it's got the boat and the drunkenness. And it's got, you know, this. Yeah, this it's got both going on. Everything rolling around, you know? Yeah. Anthony, your thoughts? I'm not thinking as much about the text as I ought to. I was thinking about the context more and how writers like Adam Piet uh, have been very engaged with the work of Mallarmé. And Mallarmé was a great presence back in the 2000s uh, when I was a young and stupid poet rather than a middle-aged and stupid poet. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that interests me is, is the way that uh, this is in dialogue uh, with other preoccupations uh, that were alive at the time. And, uh, for example, there was also a Reality Street uh, publications book of sonnets uh, where there were lots of slightly distorted or bizarre almost translations of the form. And uh, wondering where to situate that, uh, given that uh, in, in Scotland there's a very strong tradition as well of strange sonnets, say by Edwin Morgan, and Peter Manson, of course, is a Glasgow poet. So I started looking to see whether there was a turn in the sonnet right. because uh, my mind is deformed that way. And 
I suddenly thought, well, I'm buttonholed by, I'm buttonholed by is a turn, it's a Volta. But then I thought how weird the language of the last Tercet is, uh, because it reads like slogans, it reads like the language of advertising. Solitude kills real people. Right. A reefer is just for now. Mm. You know, you could have these things on the sides of packets or on posters. Uh, right. And then seamlessly opaque uh, makes me think of tights, pantyhose, you know? Seamlessly opaque. It's like, <laughs> you know, it is. It's like an A to N A ending. Uh, but then that's the opposite of what people talk about in translation, because there are a lot of metaphors which cluster around the process of translation. Many of them unhelpful. And one of the things that people look for is shine through. I mean, another thing is fidelity. But I'm thinking seamlessly opaque uh, is deliberately writing against that idea that there should be some kind of shine through yes. between source and target. It turns on any trick that validates self. Yeah. Yes, I love that. That's a great reading. Um, and cast down on your canvas suggests some kind of, and my motives suggest some kind of effort to create an art to represent such a thing. I'm reading canvas not as boat, but as painter. Uh, Ian, what's your thought? I'm just thinking about sound in the poem. Um, and one of the things that I think Anthony and I had to navigate when we were reading it was the fact that there are syllables that have, to have that, that require two phonemes um, to, to make them work. And you know, like cupidity being a nice example of where it's cup, but then it sort of has to turn into cupidity. And there was one later on, I can't remember where the other one was, um, that, that was kind of like shifting. Um, yeah, you are an hour canvas just by putting in the white. So, so I'm appreciating the level of stitching that Peter's doing. I like, I can see that he's set his rules up and he's thought, I'm going to let myself not worry about the sounds. Um, but of course, both sounds are present when we read it. And though, of course, this uh, returning to a point in one of the earlier conversations, which not everybody watching this will necessarily have <laughs> looked at, uh, <laughs> that if you read this in a Scots voice, it's very different from if you read it in a Southern English voice. Uh, so something like your canvas, if you say that, Ian. Your canvas. Exactly. So the hour yeah. is not as far. Is it not? No. Or you might even go, your canvas. <laughs> if you were getting yeah. really but, Scottish, but, but, but know, Peter but, makes yeah. it impossible because Anthony read the Y. Yeah. No, I read the Y. Oh, sorry, you read yeah, the Y. Yeah. And our, your, so you became your. Our, yeah. Our. Yeah. Our. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to have one final round of final thoughts, but I'm going to direct you and also ask you to make the final thoughts a lightning round, very brief. Um, I'll lightly direct you, please, to add in a comment as to why you would recommend this to readers. Um, what, what, what is, if you were uh, having a chit chat about a poem that you recently encountered, so, oh, you should read this Peter Manson poem. If he does this thing with Malamite, what would you say? What would be a recommendation? Um, let's start with Irene. Final thought? Um, well, I would recommend this, I think, because usually poetry can be perceived as something difficult. It's like, I don't know how to interact with the poem. I don't know how to approach the poem. And what Peter Manson is doing is like, well, this is a way you can interact with the poem. This is the poem, and then you can be in the poem too, and your words can be in the poem. So I think it's like very open and very, it's like easy access. Lovely, thank you. Eleni? Um, I'm gonna recommend reading this for just the pleasure of the language and the field of language, and also, as Irene said, away into Mallarmé. And then I also wanted to just have a final thought about the title and the last line. So between cup and lit, it, lip is this, as Leanne said, it's a, this distance between sustenance and the body and something that might be lost in between that space, such as something that's lost in translation, seems to me that suggests a poetics of between and journey, which is always going to be seamlessly opaque. Lovely, thank you. Leanne. Yeah, mirroring a little bit what Irene was saying about uh, it's collaborative with the text and that you can also do your own collaboration with it or with something else. Like it reminds me of Bernadette Mayer's experiment in the list that says type out a Shakespeare sonnet and write it over every line in between. But this is even more like, um, compacted and avant-garde, like he's doing it every other word, you know, like letter of the phrase. So it's more, more, right. more, more, you know. One can easily imagine Bernadette encountering this and adding it to her list, which yeah. she liked yeah, to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, making exactly. an experiment for this. Yeah. Do this, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Anthony? I love this because this seems to be like a way that translation theory could meet dialectics. Kamau Brathwaite's way of thinking. Kamau Brathwaite was uh, one of the Judith Wilson Poetry Fellows at the University of Cambridge a, a few years before Peter Manson, and I believe also like Leanne and me. So this is kind of like a Judith Wilson Fellow haunted poem. Oh, <laughs> but, uh, nice. more, more importantly, with dialectics of the moving to and fro of currents, and also the traffic of flotsam and jetsam across the those currents uh, mm. and the movement between the capital and the lowercase uh, in this uh, has for me that kind of dialectic traffic uh, between the drunkenness and the inspiration, uh, the imprint of the French and the new speaking of the English. Uh, and then I would just further open that out and I love poems that are in any way to do with the sea. And I would look at my divers, my divers, divers means of alienating friends. Right. That that is not just divers as in several, but divers like in divers, uh, like an Adrian Rich and diving into the wreck. Right. So this is also poetry of a wreck, mm. tide electics in a wreck. Mm. So these are, I would love to read this alongside Brathwit and Rich. Gorgeous. Great suggestion, Ian. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, why we'd recommend it is because I think it, it's, I mean, I mean, it's slightly b building on to what Leanne was saying. It shows that you can elevate a poem by being intertextual with something, something else. So the idea of starting with a field of text that you can write into, I can imagine like a really bad poem that doesn't have the Mallarmé in it, mm -hmm. that would just be kind of self-loathing. But there's something, uh, you know, because salud does also mean health. Or, yeah, yes. so, so for me, the, it's writing as a belief that writing and being in community with other writing is a way out of abjection. Yeah, nice. so uh, to your health. Yeah. And th th I tend to, after a while, focusing on form, I tend to then go looking for semantic meaning. Imagine that. Yeah. And, um, and I find for hints of first aging, mortality here, a bad health, omen of in, in unhealth, ill health. My blood already on the poop sample at 34. Um, there's surplus fat. There's um, to your health is this is a, a there's a, there, the poem to me if one reads it semantically is about desire. This morning over breakfast, I had a glass of water and between cup and lip is the is desire. Uh, I. The dif desire is the difference between what you have and what you want. And if you're drinking and if you've just toasted somebody, what you want is for this thing to now <laughs> happen to your health. Um, cup and cupidity are very, very closely related. And cupidity is partly what the tongue and the mouth do when you're reading as beautifully as the two of you did. There's a cupidity of the sound here. And it comes from the cup. Salute. Well, uh, this was great. Thank you all for this wonderful discussion of this poem. <laughs> Thank you.